talking about sex in your 60s. And I'd like to take a quick moment to say thank you so much to the chamber and the organizers of the conference. And Dr. Muir and I were so excited to be invited back as repeat offenders that uh, we're really, really happy to be here today. So sex in your 60s. I'm not talking about sex in the 60s, um, which was a possible uh, topic. Although I think sex in the 60s, the sexual revolution, may apply to a lot of the people in this audience as well as sex in your 60s. What I'm trying to teach, uh, to teach you guys today to kind of remind you is that the sex, your sexual prime, the best sexual years of your life are, are still yet to come. And you may not necessarily believe that because society would have us believe that sex is for people who are young. We say male sexual prime is 17 to sort of 25 age range. And um, female sexual prime, we say, what, 30, 40? I mean, I think it changes depending on our specific age when we're being asked that question. Um, but sexual prime is very different from genital prime, which may very well be at a younger age. So we've all talked um, about We've all talked about the various stages of relationships, and I've done talks on this. Video links are available on our website to various talks on relationships. And so when I'm talking about women in their 60s, and I guess I will premise this by saying I'm mostly going to talk about women, and I'm almost exclusively talking about male-female relationships. I've had questions from previous audiences about same gender relationships, and that could be a, a topic of another talk. But for this talk, we're going to talk about male-female relationship. Most uh, women in their 60s have um, gone through the various stages of a relationship. They may not still be in that relationship, but they understand the stages of a relationship. So the first stage of a relationship is this romance or infatuation stage when, quite truly, we're not firing on all cylinders. We're not using all the parts of our brain and we're pretty much brain dead at that stage of the relationship. And for some reason, people think they want to get back to this stage for their sex life. They want that passion, that novelty, that newness. And in fact, this stage of the relationship passes fairly quickly and is probably not where you're going to find the deepest sexual intimacy with your partner. The second stage is where the people feel as though they're sort of losing themselves in the relationship. And because they've kind of lost themselves, they sort of start to pull away from their partner. And if you make it through the power struggle stage, you move into the stability stage. So in this stage, People are defining their own path, their own identity, and oftentimes there's a tendency to drift apart in this stage. Women in their 60s, women in long-term monogamous relationships, or, or even women who are restarting relationships, will often skip through several of those stages and end up in the commitment or even co-creation stages. And again, more depth in different presentations on this. But in the commitment stage, you're in it for good. You know that this relationship is not going anywhere. You're, you've been in it for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And so you know it's not going anywhere. There's that kind of love, that kind of commitment that's there. And this is the type of relationship we're talking about where you can actually have that depth of your sexual relationship. And so I'll introduce Dr. David Schnark, who I'm going to call Dr. David because I don't think I say Schnark very well. Last year, I introduced Dr. Luanne Brizendine, and this year, a lot of my talk is out of this book, The Passionate Marriage. I think it's a very valuable read for anybody. And essentially, he describes genital prime, where basically sexual satisfaction is rubbing genitals together, climbing in bed, uh, naked, lights out, that kind of thing. And um, I guess I forgot to say at the beginning, I hope I don't offend anybody with the words that I'm using. We are talking about sex. It was on the program, so hopefully everybody's OK with those words. But he, he, decide, he determines that genital prime, um, you know, mucous membranes rubbing together are very, very different from sexual prime, and that you can't really achieve sexual prime until you're in a, in a much deeper, intimate relationship. So we're going to talk about turning the M's into yums. And the first part of that, of course, is motivation. Women in their 60s describe um, motivation or sometimes a lack of motivation to be intimate or to be sexual with their partner. And so uh, you can see some of the pictures are from Hope Springs, and if you haven't seen the movie, not a bad one to see. It really gives you an entertaining look at a very awkward situation and very much what I'm referring to in some relationships that have 
become some, somewhat stale and deadened for quite a long time. This person's sexual desire is essentially gone. His little swimmers are no longer swimming. They're actually hopping around. So he's definitely got a problem. And he's reading about 101 positions, and she's reading about 102 ways to get away. So people come in and they ask, you know, am, am I broken? And, and no, definitely you're not broken. What we learn um, is that sexual desire and the, the desire to want to be with your partner, it always makes sense. There's always generally a reason why if it's not working, it's not working. We can figure it out. It's very complex. It may take some time, but we usually figure it out. Sexual dysfunction always involves both people. But as you saw, as an as a illustrated example in Hope Springs and, and hopefully today, if one person wants to make that change, reignite the fire in the relationship, then both people pretty much have to come along for the ride. And as was quoted, when a girl marries, she exchanges the attentions of many men for the inattention of one. And unfortunately, that's what a long-term relationship can sometimes be like. Um, and so if that's the case, the sexual desire or the lack thereof makes perfect sense. So what message are you sending? If this woman is saying, never go to bed angry, actually you need to stay up all night and plot your revenge, <laughs> then there's not you know, a real desire to be intimate with this person. And you can definitely pressure your partner into wanting to have more sex, but you're never going to be able to pressure them into wanting you or or wanting him if he's pressuring you. And so actually making more demands on a relationship without going deeper into the relationship can be very unattractive. You can't separate the relationship from the sex. So we have to actually discuss the relationship. And, and as I went through the stages of the relationship, the level of intimacy in your relationship, um, that level of connection is always communicating something. So let's go back and talk about our brain. The, there's three parts to our brain. The first sort of basic function part, the fight or flight part of our brains, the reptilian part. And in general, when there's anxiety or unease or even anger in a relationship, we default to that part of our brain to communicate with each other. It becomes fight or flight. Is he leaving? You know, is this going to work out? Why, is he, why are we having such conflict? And we go back to that reptilian part of our brain to actually communicate. And there are good books on this. The, who's talking now, the crocodile or the owl, and it explains to us how we can get deeper level of connection with our partners by using the appropriate parts of our brain and also how to resolve conflict without, without defaulting or lowering ourselves to using the, the reptilian part of our brain. The next part of our brain is the mam mammalian portion, and so I'll give you an example, ducks mate, mate for life. They can show nurturing behavior with their young, and so they, they actually have a portion of their brain that involves relationships, but they don't have the most sophisticated, the most elegant, the most important part of their brain, which is the neocortex. And so thinking about relationships and which part of your brain you're using, we often kind of wish for that reptilian kind of sexual angst, when in fact what we really need to be doing is using our neocortex, which is the biggest sex organ. And a lot of people don't understand this. We really need to go into that portion of our brain in order, to, um, in order to achieve that type of sexual desire. Neocortex in charge of our sexual desire is not easy, but it is sophisticated and uniquely human. So is your neocortex involved in your sexual desire at all? In the beginning, our desire for sex was in order to ease our anxiety. So we know, for example, I've talked about this again in different talks, how um, young children will look to us, they'll make eye contact and look at our faces, they'll, they'll see our body language and they'll try to figure out whether they're worthwhile by how we're treating them. And so in relationships, sometimes we do that with our partner. We're looking to them to identify our self-worth, to determine if we're worthy and if we meet their approval. And it's interesting, a lot of women in their 40s, 50s, 60s who are in new relationships um, we were talking about this just last night. They're finding that their male, their new dating male partners want to have sex with them right away. Well, I see that as a reflected sense of self-worth. These men have been identifying with their ability to perform sexually for most of their lives, and this is their ability to say, hey, I'm worthy. If I can have great sex with you, then that makes me a whole man. 
And so having sex early in relationships when we're you know, in, the, in the older years or into second and third relationships is probably a need for someone to identify themselves and to increase their self-esteem. As that fear of rejection goes away in a relationship, the motivation to get that reflected sense of self actually goes away as well. And so our neocortical sexual desire has to be developed, and, and we don't need that activity in order to identify that we are whole people all by ourselves. So intimate sex is much better when it's done by a 60-year-old. I hope now you believe me. Intense intimacy requires time, effort, experience, and a, really know, a, real, a real knowing of yourself. Focusing on your own needs makes you a better partner, and bring your neocortex into the bedroom. We can't bring your crying vagina into the bedroom either, so we'll get to that in a minute, but we need to bring your neocortex into the bedroom. Sexual dysfunction is really important for personal growth, and so this word differentiation is something that I want you all to understand. It's your ability to hang on to who you are while also connecting with your partner. And we need to develop that sense of self that doesn't require any external validation whatsoever. So I showed this last year. This is still my favorite picture of my husband. This is him out doing a work dive off the Florida Keys. We weren't together, and he was training in his, in his duties as training as an astronaut. And I love this picture because, to me, he's a fully differentiated in this picture. There's no relying on me. I'm not relying on him while I wish he was home while I was looking after the kids and he was in the Florida Keys. But there is proof to show that men who become fully dif differentiated, women who become fully differentiated, actually make more attractive partners. And so going inside to, um, to build yourself in that way makes you more attractive. And this lady <laughs> tells us it's never too late, this woman on her chopper. So we're going to go now and look at the man, and then the man on meds. The man, of course, as I explained to you, identifies a, a lot of times if he's not what we call a manned up man or a fully differentiated man, he's identifying his, his self-worth by how he performs sexually. And unfortunately, there, are, there is a lot of male sexual dysfunction. And I was told I couldn't do this talk on sex in your 60s without talking about male sexual dysfunction. So on average, couples um, take about three to six years of having sexual dysfunction before they go and seek help. That's very unfortunate because help is out there. And then, as I said, if a man identifies his self-esteem from having great sexual relations and he's no longer able to do that, then he's going to be embarrassed, he's going to withdraw, and that withdrawal will signify, of course, to the woman that maybe she's not attractive because, of course, she's looking to him to make her feel attractive. So it's very complicated, and it affects all aspects of the relationship. <laughs> we understand. <laughs> the, the people in the vendor room are wondering why we're laughing, so I'll try and explain the picture. Of course, has a, a battery charger hooked up to a man's penis trying to wake it up. And so we know erectile dysfunction is big. We'll talk, is big, <laughs> maybe not so big. We'll talk about that. Hypoactive sexual desire or decreased libido is an issue. Premature or delayed ejaculation, these are all forms of male sexual dysfunction. And there's a complex interplay with men. They don't like to admit that there's anything wrong with them in their brain. It's all down here, but we know that it's more than biologic. So who's affected? Most men over 45. So when you get to 60, there's a good chance that the men that you're dating, the men that you're in a long-term monogamous relationship are having, some, are having some of these issues. And it's projected to affect millions of men because, of course, the baby boomer gen generation are getting older and their penises are not keeping up. Um, severity and prevalence will increase with age, so what do we do about it? In general, men like to think there's a pill to fix everything, and in this case, there is a pill to fix everything. So Viagra um, came out um, in, you know, in the 90s, and it actually gave people permission to start talking about their sexual dysfunction. We know that um, an erect penis gives you the opportunity to do different activities that you can't do with a flaccid penis, but that doesn't, isn't an absolute requirement to have good sex. Um, and it doesn't bypass the feelings, the emotion, the intimate connection, or adequate stimulation, because essentially all it does is allows vasodilatation in the blood vessels in the penis so that it can become erect. And we learned that your greatest 
largest sex organ is the neocortex, and it may very well be dilating blood vessels up there too, but there has to be a lot more going on. Ounce for ounce, it sells for 15 times the price of gold. I think that's pretty amazing and speaks very clearly about what our society values. So I couldn't talk about Viagra without also saying that there need to be some precautions. It's a vasodilator, vasodilator so anything going on with heart, brain, um, certain eye diseases we need to be careful about. And we need to ask the question, does it make sex more intimate? Does it make us more connected? Does it make it more gratifying? Do we feel more loved when we've taken Viagra? What else is available? I just want you to know that there are other means of treatment and that men who are having erectile dysfunction, that may actually be um, an initial indicator of a vascular issue or even a heart issue. So they need to be assessed. Um, I, I sh was showing this picture and of course my family couldn't figure out what was going on because I'm a gynecologist and they never see penises on my slides. So it was a bit of a scare thing. Um, and men need to be given permission. And so this is, and now, to not tell us anything about sex ed, here's Mr. Morrow. And I'm afraid, especially in Texas, we're not giving much in the way of sexual education to our boys, to our girls. And so they, they may come with certain preconceived notions about what's right, what's wrong, and, and we do as well into our relationships. So education is important. And we need to alleviate the rigidity, give them permission to do other activities, okay? So oral sex, different positions, share their fantasies. And I didn't come up with these all on my own. People have been bringing them into the office and saying, this has worked for us. We didn't know we could do this. This is working for us. And if this is working for you and it's creating more intimacy in your relationship, it's definitely uh, important. Not something you're uncomfortable with. There's lots of things that I've heard that I think, oh, not so sure. but. But definitely, if, there's, if it's something you're comfortable with, it's uh, probably a good idea to introduce it into the bedroom. And you can continue to be intimate when the penis is not erect. So alleviate the rigidity in his brain, not his penis. So now we're going to talk about the menopause. And we've heard already, we mumbled through menopause. Now we're salsing through sex in your 60s. We know that in the menopause, a lot of things can go wrong. The vagina starts crying for help. The uterus, however, um, actually, actually starts celebrating. It's done with its cramping. It's done with its bleeding. It's time to realize that we don't have those issues. It's not there to wreck your life anymore. So that's really good news in menopause. But sex can hurt. We saw the epithelial or skin changes in the vagina and some of the things that we can do to keep that vagina healthy. So these porcupines are really glad that breeding season is over because the one guy's all sutured up. Um, estrogen, really important for the vaginal tissues. Dilators, I don't love the idea of dilating the vagina. In some cases, it may be necessary or, or at least give a woman an idea of what, um, a menopausal, what her menopausal vagina that hasn't had sex in a long, long time will accommodate so that she feels confident when she goes back out into the sex scene. Um, injection, surgery, physical therapy. We've got some great physical therapists at our clinic who work with pelvic floor dysfunction. And counseling may be necessary because, of course, if it hurts, we're having psychologic and relationship issues that go along with that. What's causing the pain may be multifactorial. There may be some uh, dryness. People tell me their vagina feels it's like it's drying up like a prune. Um, and other people say, you know what, moisture is not an issue. I don't need anything extra. But I suggest lube it up. Get out the lube, use it profusely, make sure that your vagina is not being traumatized by the penetration. And I describe that to patients. Whatever is your lube of choice is a great idea. Um, and, and make sure that there's no, no trauma to that skin. Because, you guys okay? <laughs> what, what was it, the Crisco? Okay, everybody's got Crisco at home, right? <laughs> All right, cool. If you're having pain, so dyspareunia means pain, there's going to be a fear of wanting to do it again. And we saw the picture in Dr. Muir's um, pr presentation with the man felt really great. The woman had pain. If she had pain, she's not going to want to do that again. And so we get anxiety, and then we can sometimes even get an involuntary contraction or a, what I call a blink response. If I'm going to poke you in the eye, you blink. 
Same in your vagina. You know it's going to hurt. It tightens up and it doesn't allow intercourse. So these are important things to be able to alleviate early as opposed to living with them for years and years, and then it makes it harder. I want to give a quick, um, a quick note to over-the-counter compounded rem remedies. I'm not talking about bioidenticals. We've got lots of those available. But when we compound a medication, um, we need to make sure that it's under good surveillance from uh, someone in the healthcare profession. When we bring, um, when we bring homeopathic regimes into the US market, they're coming in as food additives or cosmetics, they're not undergoing the rigors of FDA testing. And so if you're taking something off the shelf that hasn't been prescribed to you, and you try and read the labels, the labeling is not necessarily um, as intense as it should be, and sometimes we don't even know what's in it, what contaminants, what concentrations, what the bioavailability of that drug would be. So be careful with those kinds of things. And so now we'll move to the motivational meds. Everyone comes in the office wanting the medication. And I think, you know what? If I had the medication that made you want to go home and have sex every day or three times a day with your partner or even once a month for some people, I'd be out selling it on the corner. It's very hard to find. But I want you to know that there are some medications coming down the pipeline that you may be hearing about and that might be available. This is to augment, of course, your sexual life, not to um, make it. I love this one. You're not that fat. <laughs> or you're OK for your age. These are definitely demotivational Valentine hearts. Some options for androgens, which is testosterone, of course, which is the sex drive hormone. Oral DHEA, which you can buy at any um, health food store. There isn't great evidence for it. It converts to testosterone peripherally. It may very well come out being um, something that, that we suggest people use. And if you're using it and you're loving it, keep using it. I don't suggest you need to stop. But so far, the science isn't behind it yet. Vulvar creams, this is a compounded form of vulvar cream. You rub it on the genitals. I had someone tell me once, if you rub it long enough, doesn't matter what it is, it's going to work. <laughs> and no kidding. And transdermal testosterone. So go get your Crisco. OK, well, 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 moving on. Transdermal testosterone patch will increase total and free testosterone to within the normal premenopausal range. Um, that's where we're trying to get. We're not trying to get you into the, the male range. We don't want any Godzilla out there. Um, significant improvements in several dimensions of sexual function have been noted with topical testosterone. There are no FDA-approved means of administering topical testosterone right now, but be on the lookout. That may very well be coming, and there are off-label or or um, not approved means of giving testosterone to people who may actually need it. Libby Gel um, is going through special approval right now, not FDA approved, but they're pushing FDA pretty hard. We'll see if that comes. What are the side effects? <laughs> so this lady is growing hair, and she's getting a deep voice, and she may be getting acne, and she may be um, gr growing, getting more angry and more hostile. Um, her clitoris may be growing into a penis. I mean, these are the kinds of things we want to watch for when we're taking supplemental testosterone. This is why testosterone needs to be monitored. Salivary testing is not good monitoring. It's notoriously inaccurate. So if you're on testosterone, make sure you're having it monitored by a healthcare professional. In general, it's safe. We've learned that estrogen and progesterone are safe in certain situations. We think testosterone probably is too. It's an anti-estrogen, so it's probably quite safe at the uterus and breast, which are estrogen responsive tissues. It's the heart we're going to have to be watching for when we give people testosterone. And flibanserin is originally marketed as an antidepressant. And when they did the antidepression scientific studies, they found it didn't help depression so much. But it really helped with sexual satisfaction. And so it, again, is not FDA approved, but it may be coming down as a non-hormonal means of helping with sexual satisfaction. But well, what are we trying to achieve? This guy's coming in the room saying, I have a confession to make. I have another woman. And she, of course, has uh, as many men in the room as she can fit. What exactly are we trying to achieve here? Sexual dysfunction can be a positive game changer in a relationship. And so let's have a look at the menu. 
I love this scene in the movie. It really was a, a change you know, in their relationship. They got a lot more creative. They got their neocortex involved. This fish is saying, what came before the Big Bang? The big foreplay. And this guy's saying, foreplay? What do you want that for? So foreplay, unfortunately, um, is something that a lot of people have kind of given up on in their long-term monogamous relationships. And I'm, I'm surprised a lot of times to find out, you know, well, we, we don't really have any foreplay. So let's talk about some ways of communicating to our partner. Foreplay is a form of communication. So if it's rushed, habitual, routine, you're trying to get, get there. I was going to say get in, get out. <laughs> That's not what I meant. If you're trying to get, get there, get in, get out, you know, what is that saying about your level of intimacy and your actual wanting to connect with your partner? What is it saying about how, ba how badly you desire him as a person? If it's soft, sensual, interactive, playful, it's definitely communicating that you have a confident sense of who you are and that you want to be with him, that you don't have a fear that he's going to leave. There's, there's a real differentiation in your person. And you're willing to share all of yourself with him. And so foreplay, um, you know, there's, there's lots of ways to do it. But if it's not work, if it's working, keep doing it. If it's not working, pull out the Crisco. Becoming a great partner means becoming a great you first. And that's harder, that's harder than it sounds. So move from other validated intimacy. Are you looking to your partner? Do you think he's judging you? Um, are you worried about what he's thinking while you're having sex? I mean, move from being validated by what he's communicating to you to actually just communicating to yourself that everything's OK. And that will meet two goals. First of all, you'll become more of a differentiated independent person, which translates to the rest of your life, but also you'll develop a more intimate um, sexual relationship as well. Let's go through the appetizers. So hugging as a metaphor for your life. If you're hugging someone and they're falling all over you and you can't really get your footing, um, that you know, signifies that they need you more than you, than you need them. And that's not a very comfortable feeling. And so in Dr. David's book, You'll read a lot about how what your hug, um, how long it lasts, what it communicates, what it means is actually somewhat a metaphor for what's going on in your relationships as well. And it's really important that you consider your stance and you focus on yourself. So who is the person in the relationship that usually breaks the hug away? It's usually one person. And you can probably identify who that is in your relationship. If it feels uneasy to be hugging, Think about it. Are you stable? Are you able to quiet yourself? Are you able to enjoy that hug or not? And eyes wide open. And I kind of told myself I wouldn't do this this morning, but I think with this crowd, I feel like probably I can. Who has had sex with your eyes wide open? OK, so it's, it's a minority. I mean, except the people who are like keeping their hands down, but I don't think that's happening out there. So eyes wide open. Our eyes are our window into our soul. And you can never have direct eye contact with someone without connecting with them. You are definitely connected with them when you're seeing them. So in general, everyday conversations, eye contact will distinguish people who are agreeing with each other versus people who are in conflict. And in bed, an eye, con eye contact expresses that you actually want to be there. So use your eye contact to tell your partner how important they are to you. And it's interesting. Looking and seeing your partner can feel like a heroic act of bravery. Try it for all those people who didn't raise your hand. Try laying in bed and staring at your partner. Okay, It's going to feel awkward, therapeutic maybe, feeling like a failure. You're going to feel like, well, why are we doing this? Let's just go back to the old way. Let's turn the lights off, You know, stop looking at each other. But eventually, it gives you a really great opportunity to just soothe yourself, to realize that that anxiety you're feeling has to be soothed from within. He's not going to soothe that anxiety for you. And so use eye contact as a means of knowing how intimately connected you are with your partner. And eventually, um, as we saw in Hope Springs, when one person in the relationship decides to change, so will the other one. And so we are often paired with someone who's of similar differentiation to ourselves. And we grow together, or we grow in different ways. And when one person decides, I'm not happy with this, I am going to work on myself in this relationship and bring a better me to you, then the relationship will blossom. 
And so make sure that you start slow with this if it makes you uncomfortable, maybe outside the bedroom eye contact. I used to I used to laugh that my husband would come home with a haircut, and it took me about 24 hours to realize he'd had a haircut. And so making sure that we're seeing our partner day to day is a really good idea, you know? And then peekaboo sex. If you can't do eyes wide open the whole time, then maybe close your eyes and then just open it a little bit. He's not looking, so you can look a little longer. He's still not looking. Oh, there he opened his eyes. I'm going to close mine again. And, and try that for a little while first. How about giving him the look? Gives you an idea of how important eye contact is. I mean, if you guys are intimately connected and you're out at a party and you give him the look, he's the only one that understands the look, it's not a bad idea to use your eyes in that way too. And how about the wine pairings? These guys are <laughs> terrified. Before I talk about the wine pairings, just want to let you know that um, it may be a little sensitive. Um, so if you have limitations, you can keep them. That's the good thing about limitations. Once you recognize them, they're yours. And this little penguin is saying, until you spread your wings, you have no idea how far you can walk. Take some risks. Go ahead. Gives us all something to laugh at. So brilliant, brilliant marketing. This is Brookstone. I get the magazine in my home every day. I was looking at these things thinking, seriously, you're marketing these as personal massagers. Right. They list them as, um, you know, they come in different colors, they come in different power settings, they, they come water resistant. I mean, they come in travel sizes. These things are personal massagers. Order one. Nobody's going to know. It, it's not going to hurt to have one of these very close to the bed just in case you need it for increased sensation or a flaccid penis that you want, that your partner and you want to overcome with something a little more rigid. It's not a bad idea. Now this one, use caution. So this is also in the Brookstone catalog and probably other places. This is the female side or whatever you want to call it. And this is the remote control that can be used from 30 feet away. This is a good party trick. <laughs> and a little more medicinal, there are suction devices that you can put on the clitoris that can sort of overcome a lack of, um, of vasodilatation in the clitoral area, and also good for enhancing sexual pleasure and orgasm. How about the main course? So if we get into a relationship and we have validated each other, we have validated ourselves more importantly, we've gone through the hugging, we've gone through the eye contact, we get to a point in our lives as individuals, we no longer expect validation from our partner and paradoxically, that's how we get it. We become more attractive partners to them. We're more connected, we have our guard down, we're stop, we stop trying to gain ground in arguments, push buttons, we're using the neocortex, not the reptilian part of our brain when we have conflict and we're deepening our relationship. Become uniquely yourself and bring new resources into your relationship. True differentiation means true intimacy. So you really can do it without your partner, you just start working on yourself. So most sexual behaviors, as we've learned, you turn the lights out, you close your eyes, they don't promote intimacy. When you're looking at someone, when you actually see them, when you're communicating with them, when you're touching them in new and creative ways, when you pull the personal massager out from under the bed, you know, these are, these are ways of communicating that I'm going to stir it up a little bit. I want to be here, and I want us to be in this for the long haul. We're in our 60s now. We don't have the kids to worry about. It's time to focus on us. Your comfort and connection in bed is a really good indicator of how intimate your relationship is out of the bedroom. And this guy's saying, you know, hon, I think that was one of the best orgasms you ever faked. <laughs> and she frankly looks quite happy about it. So the dessert. This is the payoff for putting in all this effort and energy. It's not going to be easy but we have greater release of hormones that create greater calmness and pain suppression at a time when our joints are starting to ache, fingers are starting to hurt, we, we ache to get out of bed in the morning. We have, in our long-term relationships, we know that we have better pain suppression, less obsession, less anxiety, less concern that he's leaving. We have all the feel-good hormones we can tap into. And essentially, as women, society has demanded, and we have 
we've been okay with it so far, of looking after everyone around us. Women in their 60s, women, I would like to say women younger as well, should start looking after themselves. Connecting and tending to others becomes less important as women move into their retirement years and self-care is much more important. And that carries over into all aspects of our life. Work and accomplishment become central. And we know that women with career momentum, which they're able to have when their children have moved out and their college tuition's all paid, um, and they have better measures of self-acceptance, independence, and also better physical functioning in their 50s and 60s. And the modeling. If you have a great sexual relationship and you, and you have a great intimate relationship, and most importantly, you have a fully differentiated self, internally validated person that you're presenting to the world, you're going to model that for your family. You're going to model that for your children, your grown children if you're in your 60s. And they're going to see what's important. And then they're going to be able to translate that to the rest of their lives as well. And we know that children who come from Relationships that are long, enduring relationships have better health status, better functioning in school, better academic performance. We know over the long term that enduring relationships are link linked to better quality of life, better health, and sexuality plays an important role in making that relationship stick together. It's the glue. Know that when you have attained all of those things, that internal validation and that intimacy with your partner, that you're an inspiration for people around you, that we're watching you to learn. And when I hear that someone's been together with a specific part, one specific partner for 30, 40, 50 years, I always ask them how they did it. What was, what was the factor you think or the factors that determined that that relationships stayed together for so long. I want to know because I want to be able to do that. So this is our clinic. Dr. Muir has um, ex explained as well. We're at the Pelvic Health Center at Victory Lakes. We offer all kinds of services. Um, I write for Life is Good magazine, which you can pick up with the vendors. Dr. Muir and I have started a new column. Hopefully you've seen it in the Galveston Daily News, Our Bodies, Our Lives. And we're hoping that you start to follow and get educated by some of the things that we're putting in there. And also give us some input about some of the topics you'd like to hear about. <clears throat> I have put my references here and especially utmbhealth.com slash pelvic health where there's video links. You can watch some of the presentations and education events that Dr. Muir and I are presenting. Um, I have an account on Twitter you can follow. I've already tweeted a little bit today and please do that as well. And we also have a blog that is starting, a UTMB blog that is starting to run, and Dr. Muir and I have put educational and community information on there as well. These books are fantastic. Dr. Schnark, I can't say his name very well, um, has some great books out there, and he also has a website and some of these other great reading that can help you as well in your journey to the best sex of your life.